स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया this lecture we will explore the local behavior of a non constant holomorphic function defined on an open connected set omega we will prove that given a point z0 in omega there exists a neighborhood u such that in the punctured neighborhood u minus z0 our function f is an m21 mapping we will come to that but before that let's uh, prove a special case of the inverse function theorem which states that if uh, the derivative of the function f does not vanish at a point z0 then the function is locally invertible in a neighborhood of z0 and further uh, we have a holomorphic inverse let's begin this lecture uh, by proving a preparatory lemma which is needed to prove the inverse function theorem let me write that down let f be a function holomorphic on an open set omega the holomorphic on an open set omega then define capital g from omega cross omega into c given by g of z comma w this is defined to be equal to f of z minus f of w by z minus w when z is not equal to w and f prime at uh, z when z is equal to w the lemma states that this function g is a continuous function then g is continuous on omega cross omega the first observation here would be that uh, away from the diagonal points z is equal to w the continuity is quite straightforward we only need to really bother about proving continuity at the diagonal points we shall prove continuity along the diagonal on the points z is equal to w which is the diagonal the first observation in this uh, direction would be the following given uh, z0 in omega let's try to prove that on some neighborhood uh, of z0 comma z0 in omega cross omega we will be able to talk about continuity of g and uh, in order to do that let's first pick a neighborhood uh, since f prime is also a holomorphic function and in particular a continuous function we have r positive or uh, uh, given an epsilon positive and r such that for z comma w in d z0 r we have or maybe just some point z in d z0 r we have the absolute value of f prime at z minus the absolute value of uh, minus the, the sorry absolute value of the derivative of f at z minus the derivative of f at z not this is less than epsilon this is just uh, by using the continuity of f prime at the point z0 now in this uh, disk dz0 r let's pick two points pick z comma w in dz0 r where z is not equal to w now if you look at uh, the disk it's a convex set in particular if you look at the line joining z and w that's contained in dz0 r let gamma of t be equal to 1 minus t times z plus t times w 
be the straight line joining for T in 0, 1. Be the straight line joining Z to W and notice that uh, gamma prime of T is just equal to W minus Z again for T in 0, 1. So, we know exactly what the derivative is as well. It is a nice curve, straight line curve and we know this. Now, if you try to integrate f prime of gamma of t dt from 0 to 1, notice that this is a real integral once we break it up into uh, real and imaginary parts, we can act, add, uh, multiply and divide by w minus z here and uh, w minus z being a constant will come out and w minus z is also the same as gamma prime of t dt from 0 to 1. And if we are to use the change of variable formula now, this is just the integral over gamma f prime of z dz. And now by invoking the fundamental theorem of calculus, this is going to be f of w is the end point minus f of z the initial point by w minus z, which if you notice is g of z comma w. Right? When z is not equal to w, that is precisely how we had defined g of z comma w. Now if, uh, now, if we consider g of z comma w minus g of z0 comma z0, this is just equal to the integral 0 to 1 f prime of, recall what we started off with, this is what we had started off with, 0 to 1 f prime of gamma of t dt and uh, g of z0, z0 is just f prime at z0. But if I write it in this manner, it is the same and hence, if you look at the absolute value here, that is the absolute value here, which is the absolute value of the integral from 0 to 1 of f prime of gamma of t minus f prime at z0 dz, sorry dt. And we know that uh, being a convex set for every t gamma of t is in dz0 r and therefore f prime of gamma of t minus uh, f prime at z0 has absolute value less than epsilon. So, this is less than or equal to epsilon. That is precisely what we were trying to prove, right. So, hence in dz0 r cross dz0 r, which is the neighborhood we were looking for, we have, of course, if you are going along the diagonal, there is nothing to prove anyway and therefore, uh, you may just directly write that, uh, maybe none of this is needed. Let me just directly conclude that hence g is continuous at z0 comma z0 in omega cross omega. That is what we were trying to prove. Of course, I have not uh, addressed all possible scenarios, but the other ones are quite simple and straightforward. You can sit down and think about it. Now that we have this preparatory lemma, let us jump into the inverse function theorem that I was referring to. The statement will go as follows. The theorem, let f from omega to c be holomorphic on an open connected set. Let me this time use, or maybe not uh, connectedness is not yet needed. Let us see, I will add connectedness if it is needed later. Open set such that now, let suppose z0 is a point in omega such that f prime at z0 is not equal to 0. Then there exists a neighborhood u of z0 such that f restricted to u is injective. So, neighborhood u of z0 in omega. So, the neighborhood u is contained in omega. 
and hence we can restrict our function f to u and f restricted to u is injective. Further, furthermore, we have f of u is an open set. Let us call it v, v equal to f of u is an open set and the inverse g from v to u of f is holomorphic. I will urge you to go through this uh, statement once more. Let me uh, summarize this theorem for you. It basically tells us that if uh, our holomorphic function uh, satisfies the condition that at a point z0, its derivative does not vanish, locally we can get hold of a inverse of this uh, function g which is also holomorphic. In the process, we do have that uh, a neighborhood of z0 is mapped to a, a neighborhood to an open set in the image. Let us give a proof of this statement. We will, uh, we will be using the proprietary lemma uh, that was uh, proved earlier and in order to do that, let us pick some epsilon. Let epsilon be equal to f prime of z0 absolute value by 2. Notice that uh, f prime at z0 is a non-zero complex number and therefore our epsilon is also going to be non-zero. Now there exists a neighborhood from the previous lemma by the lemma above or rather the proof of the lemma above there exists a neighborhood what is the neighborhood d z0 r of z0 such that for z comma w in uh, d z0 r let us call this neighborhood u this is going to be our candidate for the u so i'll just start writing u from here for z comma w in u and z is not equal to w we have the absolute value of f of z minus f of w by z minus w minus f prime at z0 this is less than epsilon which is in our case f prime at z0 by 2. Now let us do some manipulation using the triangle inequality. Let me write this uh, inequality in this manner now. This is greater than the absolute value written to the left here which let me say is greater than or equal to the absolute value of f prime of z0 minus the absolute value of f of z minus f of w by z minus w. So I have used the triangle inequality here already a version of it to write this particular step and we can finally conclude that f of z minus f of w by bringing it to the left, this is greater than mod of f prime of z0 by 2 times mod of z minus w. What does this tell us? This tells us that if z is not equal to w, in particular f prime of z0 is not equal to 0, so this number is going to be a positive number. We have f of z minus f of w will have a positive absolute value which implies that f of z is not equal to f of w. So we now have a neighborhood hence f restricted to u is injective that is the uh, first statement we had written in the theorem. Let me go up and show you the theorem for you. f restricted to u is injective was the first observation that we had to prove. Let us next try to prove that f of u is an open set and to do that let us pick some point uh, arbitrary point in f of u and we will prove that that is an interior point of f of u that is our next goal. So to do that uh, let us start with some point let us start with some a in u we will show that f of a is an interior point that will uh, prove that f of u is an open set interior point of f of u 
right. So, if uh, A is some point then uh, being an open set uh, U being an open set there exists some R is taken. So, let S greater than 0 be a positive number such that the disk of radius S around A the closure is contained in U. Now, let us apply our uh, con conclusion here that we had earlier taken to the points on the boundary of uh, the disk of radius uh, S around A and the point A. Notice that the closure being contained in U is going to be used crucially. Then let me put the equation a uh, number or uh, maybe a symbol by star. What do we have? We have f of a plus s e to the power i theta for all theta we have theta in r in fact. Uh, well, theta in r or 0 to 2 pi does not make a difference. Let me put 0 to 2 pi. Every point on the circle of uh, radius s around a that is what is meant minus f of a. Notice that both these points are in u and therefore, this is greater than mod f prime of z0 by 2 times mod of z minus w which is just going to be equal to s here. So, let us call this number as c. If you notice the right hand side uh, depends neither on uh, the theta nor on a, it is some constant number s. This is good. So, what is being said is that uh, what is being concluded here is that f of a plus s e to the power i theta is always outside a disk of radius c around f of a. So, if you have f of a here and suppose this is the uh, disk of radius s uh, radius c around f of a, then f of a plus s e to the power i theta will be outside this disk of radius c. So, in particular uh, let, let us pick some point w in d f of a c by 2. Let us take a disc of radius c by 2. Then any point inside this disc will be at a distance greater than c by 2 from any of the f of a plus s e to the power i theta, is not it? Then it is a just a triangle inequality thing that I have written here f which I am writing here f of w minus f of a plus s e to the power i theta this is going to be greater than c by 2. So, even though I just said uh, that this is the case by looking at the picture it can be established by writing down the triangle inequality in the right manner. So, this is something which we can conclude for all theta in r or in 0 to 2 pi. Now, suppose our function f does not take uh, a uh, does not have w in its image. Suppose there does not exist z in u not uh, in omega let us focus just on u after all we are studying something local here. Suppose there does not exist a function z in u uh, such that f of z is equal to w. Suppose we do not have such a function. Maybe I, could, I should put a w not here. W sounds more generic. So, let me put a W not here. Suppose we do not have a, a, any point z getting mapped to W. Then consider g of if you look at f of z minus W not this function, then this function does not vanish on u. It does not vanish on u. And hence, g of z equal to 1 by f of z minus w naught is holomorphic on u. Now, let us invoke the maximum principle. We are in a perfect setup to apply the maximum principle to this holomorphic function g. And what compact set? The compact set uh, that we are going to use is d0 d z 0 r bar or sorry s bar. We will use this particular compact set and uh, 
uh, use the maximum principle. What can we conclude by the maximum principle? Maximum principle applied to G and the compact set D Z zero S bar. Remember that G is a function which is holomorphic on U and D Z zero S bar is a compact set contained in U. The maximum principle absolute value of G of Z is less than or equal to the supremum over the boundary which I will now write it as supremum over theta absolute value of G of uh, oh, I am sorry, this is not what I want exactly, it is A, I made a mistake, this is not Z0, this is A. Yeah, everything else is right and the supremum will be over the boundary S e to the power i theta. That is precisely what our maximum principle will tell us for all Z in D A S. But then uh, what do we have? Supremum of uh, G, this is nothing but 1 by F of A plus S e to the power i theta minus W, the absolute value of this. And we are looking at the uh, supremum of this quotient which is going to be 1 by infimum over all theta which satisfies this. So let me write that down. This is going to be 1 by f of z minus w. This absolute value is less than or equal to this infimum which tells us that the infimum over theta absolute value of f of a plus, I picked a w naught, right? So let me put w naught. This absolute value is infimum over this absolute value is less than or equal to the absolute value of f of z minus w naught. But notice that to the left we know that for all theta. Uh, absolute value of f of a plus s e to the power i theta minus w naught is greater than c by 2. If you notice that is precisely what we had uh, uh, concluded here. Where did we conclude that? Hmm. The line I am underlining in green exactly said that f of w naught is at a distance of uh, at least c by 2 from any point on the boundary f of s a plus s e to the power i theta and this tells us that the infimum will also be greater than or equal to c by 2. And what about the right hand side? We know that f of z minus w naught, this is strictly less than c by 2 because w naught, okay, uh, in particular f of a minus w naught is also less than c by 2, right? This is true for all z. Let me just note that this is true for all z in d a s. In particular, it is true at the point a as well and therefore, uh, this inequality should hold at the point A as well. But that is a contradiction because this left hand side is uh, greater than or equal to C by 2 and the right hand side is uh, less than C by 2 and therefore this inequality is go not going to hold. This there is a contradiction which is a contradiction. So our assumption has to be false. What was our assumption? This was our assumption. If we are assuming that W0 does not have a pre image in U, then by applying maximum principle, we have come to a contradiction. And therefore, hence, there exists some Z in U such that F of Z is equal to W0. But that is precisely what we were trying to. Uh, prove right. This tells us that d f of a c by 2 
this particular disk in the complex plane is contained in f of u right what is that our uh, w naught was picked here so in particular we will be able to uh, conclude that uh, this particular disk is contained in f of u and hence f of a is an interior point so we are good because now what have we established we have established that f of u is open so let's call it v v equal to f of u is an open set so that means f restricted to u is a bijective map from u to v we already uh, started off this proof by establishing that on u f is injective we have also shown that it maps on to u and on to v an open set therefore this is a bijective map now let g from v to u be its inverse we will show that uh, g is a holomorphic function on v so to do that let w not maybe w w not was okay w prime be a point in v let's try to prove that uh, g is holomorphic uh, on w prime to do that let's look at for w in v and w not equal to w prime let's look at what is g of w minus g of w prime by w minus w prime now the good thing here is that v is exactly f of u and uh, because of that we will be able to get hold of z in u and z prime in z and z prime in u such that f of z is equal to w and f of z prime is equal to w prime what is that f being injective ensures that z and z prime are uh, distinct so writing this we will be able to get uh, the following here g of f of z g is an inverse so this is going to be z minus z prime by f of z minus f of z prime and we can write this as 1 by f of z and f of z prime are distinct that's what uh, the point here is and hence z minus z prime is also distinct we will be able to write this as f of z minus f of z prime by z minus z prime we are almost through because uh, now we just have to show that as w goes to w prime z goes to z, z prime so the claim is the following uh, as if limit if we take a sequence w converging to w prime then z converges to z prime where f of z is equal to w and uh, the the uh, observation follows again from star that was noted earlier let me just go back to that uh, inequality so this is the inequality in question this tells us that uh, the absolute value of f of z minus f of w is uh, bounded below let me write that down here we have absolute value of f of z minus f of z prime let us now focus on u this is greater than absolute value of z prime f prime at z 0 by 2 times z minus z prime but then what is this inequality f of z can be written as w and this is w prime so let me just write it the other way absolute value of z minus z prime this is less than some constant times constant is 2 by absolute value of f prime at z naught and uh, this is f of z will just be equal to w and f of z prime is just equal to w prime so in particular if w is converging to w prime z will also converge to z prime and hence we have this claim and thus we get to conclude that limit as w going to w prime of g of w minus g of w prime by w minus w prime this is equal to the limit as z goes to z prime where w is uh, in u minus 
W prime. We have used the injectivity of uh, F very crucially. So this is going to be the limit as Z is in, okay, this is in V minus W prime. This is going to be in U minus Z prime of uh, 1 by F of Z minus F of Z prime by Z minus Z prime, which is equal to 1 by F prime at uh, Z prime. Okay, the two primes shouldn't be confused. One is F prime and the other is Z prime. So, in particular, our function G is uh, complex differentiable at every point in uh, our given domain omega. And I will leave the uh, conclusion to you to conclude that hence G is holomorphic on, on V. That is what we were trying to prove. So, let us just uh, recap what we have established. We proved that uh, if we start off with a holomorphic function whose derivative does not vanish at a given point z0, then we get a, a holomorphic inverse. This is also sometimes called as uh, f being a local biholomorphism. Biholomorphism is a holomorphic map whose inverse is also holomorphic. So, this is a local biholomorphism. All right, let us now look at uh, one particular function very specifically. Uh, let us consider this function z going to z to the power m. Let us call a name to it phi m from c to c. The, the map phi m of z equal to z to the power m. We have seen that this is an entire function and that at any point away from 0, the derivative does not vanishes for z0 not equal to 0, phi m prime at z0 is not equal to 0 and therefore, this function is uh, a locally uh, local biholomorphism. It has a local uh, inverse which is also holomorphic around z0 when z0 is not equal to 0. So, in particular, if uh, we work on some neighborhood, if V is a neighborhood such that uh, V does not, V is an open set, neighborhood of what? V is an open set which does not contain the origin. Then at every point, uh, we will be able to get hold of a uh, neighborhood of the point Z0 who, whose image is also an open set. That means that pi m of V is also an open set. So, you take any open set V uh, which does not contain the origin, then pi m of V is also an open set by the inverse function p number because at every point the derivative does not match. How about uh, at the point uh, uh, 0? Recall that by a uh, theorem we have proved earlier, uh, we know the exact roots to the equation z to the power m equal to w when w is a non-zero number. Let me recall that for you. Recall that this was one of the problems we did in uh, a problem session uh, in, in one of the first few weeks of this course. Recall that if w is equal to r e to the power i theta is not the uh, uh, complex number 0, then uh, there exists then z to the power m equal to w has roots given by z m equal to r to the power 1 by m, maybe z k equal to r to the power 1 by m e to the power i theta by m plus 2 pi k by m, where k is from 0, 1 up to k minus 1. And using this, you can conclude that 
pi m maps a disk of radius r around uh, the origin to the disk of radius r to the power m. This is exactly what we will be getting. So, pi m behaves very in a very nice manner and uh, that is something which we will be going to use to explore how our function holomorphic function f behaves locally in a neighborhood of our given point z0. Let us now explore the local behavior of uh, a holomorphic function in a neighborhood of a point z0 in its domain of definition. We will in fact show that uh, given a point z0, we will be able to get hold of a neighborhood such that uh, on this neighborhood, the punctured neighborhood rather, our function f is an m to 1 function. Given any point on the image, there are m free images there. So, let me write down the statement local behavior of holomorphic functions. Let me write it down as a theorem. Let f from omega to c be a holomorphic function. Be a holomorphic function. Maybe more careful. Let me be a uh, little more careful here. It's not uh, any holomorphic function. It's going to be a non-constant holomorphic function. And I want it to be on each component. So, let me impose the condition that omega is an open connected set as well. On an open connected set omega contained in C. Let us fix a point. Let z0 be some point uh, in omega and uh, w0 be the image of z0 under f. So, w0 is f of z0. The conclusion is that when there exists a neighborhood u uh, of z0 and uh, bijective holomorphic function phi on u such that f of z is equal to w0 plus p of z to the power m for z in u and some uh, integer m greater than 0. Moreover, we can arrange for our phi to map u onto a disk. Phi maps u on to d 0 r for some r positive. Let us look at the statement once more. What this tells us is that if you carefully look at what we have concluded here, we have successfully written down in a neighborhood of z 0 how our function uh, f behaves. It behaves in this manner f of z is w0 plus phi of z to the power m. Phi is an injective map and phi of z to the power m is just pi m composed with phi and therefore, the injective map will be an m to 1 map. So, we will we'll come to all the details one by one. The key thing to note is that locally in a neighborhood of z0, we have been able to explicitly find out how our f behaves. Okay, let us try to prove this statement. Since we know that f of z0 is equal to w0, we know that f of z minus w0, this holomorphic function has a 0 at z0. Since f of z0 is equal to w0, we know that g of z equal to f of z minus w0 vanishes at z0. Let me not unnecessarily bring in notations. f of z minus w0 vanishes at z0. Now, by applying the factorization theorem repeatedly, in fact, I will use the g now. By using the factorization, the factorization theorem repeatedly, 
we, we can write f of z minus w naught to be equal to z minus z naught to the power m times g of z for some m positive and such that g of z naught is not equal to 0. So, a key thing to keep in mind is that while we did this, we have very crucially used the fact that f is a non-constant function and uh, because of that all derivatives of f at the point z0 cannot vanish. Because if that happens then by the principle of analytic continuation f would be identically equal to 0. And uh, that is precisely the reason why we are able to get hold of one such m to write our f of z minus w0 as uh, z minus z0 to the power m times g of z and where g of z0 is not equal to 0. Now since g of z0 is not equal to 0, by continuity we will be able to get hold of a small disk around z0 where g does not vanish. So let epsilon positive be epsilon is not a good uh, and r is already taken. So s positive be such that g of z is not equal to 0 on d z0 s. Let me invoke one of the problems we have proved earlier. You should go back to the problem sessions that we have done earlier. We have proved that if we are in a simply connected domain u and if uh, g is a function which does not vanish on u, then we will be able to get hold of a holomorphic function h such that g is equal to e to the power h. That is something which we had done while we uh, proved the Cauchy's theorem uh, some time back. I will urge you to go back and have a look at that problem. Recall that uh, dz0s is a uh, disk of radius s, in particular it is convex, it is in fact simply connected. So maybe I should write that since dz0s is simply connected. and g does not vanish on dz0 s, there exists a holomorphic function h on dz0 s such that g is equal to e to the power g of z is equal to e to the power h of z on dz0 s. Now let us define what our phi is going to be, we, are, we have developed every uh, machinery needed to define wh what our phi should be. Define phi on dz0s to be phi of z is equal to z minus z0 into e to the power h of z by m. So notice what we have done we have f of z minus w naught is equal to z minus z0 to the power m times g of z, right. So if you look at what is phi of z to the power m, this is equal to z minus z0 to the power m times e to the power h of z which is equal to z minus z0 to the power m times g of z which is equal to f of z minus w naught. So on d z0 s we already have f of z is equal to w naught plus phi of z to the power m. That was one of the conclusions right that we were drawing in, in this uh, particular uh, theorem. If you notice here of course we have some more work to do there exists a bijective holomorphic function phi on u such that this happens. So we have already established that uh, phi is uh, indeed uh, satisfying this condition, we will now prove that it is indeed bijective and holomorphic. Holomorphicity also follows by the very definition. The first thing to notice uh, here is that what is phi prime at z0? If you look at phi prime at z0, that is just going to be equal to e to the power h of z0 by m, which is not equal to 0. And this is precisely where our uh, inverse function theorem that we proved earlier is going to come into the picture. We will now prove that going down to a further neighborhood, let u prime, it's still not the u we want, let u prime be 
neighborhood of Z0 in DZ0S such that phi restricted to U prime is injective and phi of uh, U prime is an open set by our inverse function theorem we have this. We should also note that uh, Z0 is uh, where is Z0 getting mapped by phi our definition of phi is such that Z0 is mapped to 0. So, in particular since phi of Z0 is equal to 0 we can now use the fact that phi of u prime is open uh, there exists some um, well I am running short of notations s prime greater than 0 such that d 0 s prime is contained in phi of u prime. Now define our u to be equal to phi inverse of d 0 s prime in u contained in u. This is the uh, open set we are going to work with. Uh, check, let us check everything that we need to check. On u, we have f of z minus w naught is equal to phi of z to the power m and that is what we were trying to prove, right. This is in fact true on the entire dz0s but rather we can restrict our uh, attention to a smaller set u where for sure we can say that uh, phi is injective phi is uh, bijective and holomorphic on u and phi of u is equal to oh this is not s prime why did i uh, pick s prime here our final goal was to get hold of an r so let me use the r as well in this particular place this is equal to d0 r and that is precisely what we were trying to show. So, notice that uh, we were able to write f of z as being equal to z0 plus phi of z to the power m which is the same as pi m composed with uh, phi of z of z and the good thing about pi m is that pi m in the punctured disc is an m21 mapping and phi is an injective mapping and therefore f of z minus z naught this in fact f of z oh, I'm writing wrong this is w naught f of z is hence an m21 mapping on u minus z naught z naught has to be removed because z naught is what is getting mapped to uh, 0 by phi and therefore on the punctured disc our mapping is going to be an m21 mapping yeah this is following because phi of u is precisely d0 r that is why this particular uh, arrangement was uh, made so that you know the image is exactly d0 r and then on d0 r our map pi m or rather on the punctured disk d0 r minus 0 our map pi m is an m21 mapping. So, f is going to be an m21 mapping on u minus z0. Let me conclude this lecture by stating the open mapping theorem. Open mapping theorem states that if uh, f is a function which is non-constant and holomorphic on an open connected set omega then f of omega is open. We will be able to now derive our open mapping theorem as a trivial corollary to the work we have done in this particular lecture. So, the open mapping theorem says this let f from omega to c be a non constant holomorphic function f on omega on an open connected set omega. then f of omega is an open set.
the proof is quite straightforward. Let z0 be in omega and w be equal to f of z0, w not be equal to f of z0. By the previous theorem, there exists a neighborhood u of z0 such that f of z is equal to w0 plus p of z to the power m on u and such that p of u is equal to d 0 r. If you think about uh, what this means, this means that f of u is going to be equal to, so pi m composed with p, hence pi m composed with p of u is just going to be equal to pi m composed with d 0 r which is going to be d 0 r to the power m and hence f of u is just going to be equal to d w 0 r to the power m which I will just write it as capital R. So, hence every point w 0 is an interior point of the image, w 0 is an interior point. of f of omega and this tells us that f of omega is open. So, the open mapping theorem comes out as a simple corollary to uh, the uh, study of the local behavior of our holomorphic function f in a neighborhood of a point.